A Race Around the World. This is the true story of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland, who in the late 1800s each started out in New York City, but went the opposite way, and they raced each other to see who could get around the world first. Such a fun story. All right, we see a map, and I'm going to show you here is New York City. And so Nellie Bly headed this way to go around the world and coming back this way. And then Elizabeth Bisland, she headed the opposite direction, starting in the same location. And she went this way, came back around, and they were going to find out who was the winner when they met back in New York City. This book is called A Race Around the World, The True Story of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland, written by Carolyn Star Rose, illustrated by Alexandra Bai. The world was a whirl in 1889. Telegraph messages whizzed over wires. Express trains and steamships flew at top speeds. Big cities boasted electrical lights and a talking device called the telephone. How long would it take to circle this newly speeding world? One travel writer girdled the globe in only a year and a half. An all-star baseball team knocked out the trip in six quick months. Author Jules Verne's fictional hero, Thelaeus Fogg, went around the world in 80 days, a trip so amazing it could take place only in the pages of a storybook. A reporter named Nellie Bly believed she could be even faster. Nellie loved a challenge. After studying ship routes and train schedules, she was certain she could travel the world in 75 days, a one-woman race against distance and time. The adventure would make a great story. Her boss at the New York World said only a man could manage such a trip. Ladies never traveled alone, and they always packed far too much luggage. Very well, Nellie said. Start the man, and I'll start the same day for the, some other newspaper and beat him. I believe you would, said her boss. When Nellie finally learned she could go, she had just three days to prepare. On November 14, 1889, Nellie boarded the Augusta Victoria from a New Jersey dock. Clutching a single bag, in 75 days, she'd be back. She couldn't fail. In a New York apartment, only a few miles away from the docks, Elizabeth Bisland was leisurely reading when a messenger arrived at her door. She was needed at work immediately. Elizabeth's publisher at the Cosmopolitan magazine had just read in the paper of Nellie Bly's trip. Would you leave New York this evening for San Francisco, he asked Elizabeth, and continue from there around the world. He was sure she could beat Nellie. At first, Elizabeth said, I mean to do nothing of the sort. She had never left the country before. She had no desire to race Nellie Bly. She was content with her quiet work. But Elizabeth had always dreamed of traveling the world, visiting the places she'd read of in books. She'd do the job she'd been given. There were only five hours to prepare before her train left Grand Central. The race was on. Elizabeth's train careened west, fierce as a runaway horse. At daybreak on the second day, she awakened to a world etched with ice crystals. Sailing for England, Nellie's eastbound steamer lurched and pitched as though light as a juggler's ball. She sat at the ship captain's table, battling seasickness. Far out at sea, Nellie had no way of knowing that her one-woman dash was now a contest of two. Exciting news awaited Nellie in England. 
Author Jules Verne wanted to meet the young lady trying to beat Phileas Fogg, the hero of his book. But Nellie's next stop was supposed to be Italy, and Jules lived in France. The detour meant two sleepless nights as she took two trains through England, a ferry to France, and yet another train for the brief visit with Jules. Two more train rides later, Nellie reached Italy hours behind schedule. She dashed to the pier, arriving at her ship just in time. In San Francisco, crowds buzzed with questions for Elizabeth. They jostled to see the brave lady journalist set sail. How excited she was to leave her country for the very first time. One day from shore, a storm boiled in the Pacific. Waters raged as the ship bucked and groaned. At last the storm faded. Elizabeth ventured on deck. She was mesmerized with the ocean's depths of sparkling sapphire and shades of violet. There was so much to see, such wonder and beauty. It was like a page from a book, only better. Nellie arrived in Ceylon two days early. Such a satisfying feat. She was the first passenger from her ship to reach shore. Nellie feasted on fiery curry and lounged in the cool ocean breeze. She took a moonlit ride under arching palms while waves roared on the beach. Then bad news, Nellie's ship was delayed. Her two-day stopover stretched to five. Three more days stuck in Ceylon. Nellie fretted. She stormed about. Her head pounded furiously. In the cities of Japan, Elizabeth browsed in shops brimming with porcelain, flowers, fabrics, and jade. She marveled at sloping hills and mist-filled valleys. She wandered temples and tombs as elegant as poetry. White lanterns swung from gin rickshaws, dancing like fireflies. At night, the moon transformed the bay to flowing gold. Two days in Japan weren't nearly enough. Elizabeth promised herself one day she'd return to the land where Mount Fuji shone like a pearl. In Singapore, Nellie bought a feisty macaque, which she named Mick Ginty. If you see what's on her shoulder, it looks like a type of monkey. In Hong Kong's harbor, Elizabeth was entranced by the glitter of lights and the sampans gliding in the evening mist. A roaring monsoon battered Nellie's ship. A steamer with a broken propeller changed Elizabeth's travel plans. During the third week of December in the South China Sea, two steamers passed. One carried Nellie, one Elizabeth. There was no way to know who was winning. The other woman, she is going to win, the man at the steamship office told Nellie when she arrived in Hong Kong. This other woman, he said, had passed through Hong Kong just days before. Nellie stared at him. What other woman? What could he mean? It's too bad, he said, but I think you have lost. Nellie could hardly believe it. In this moment, when time mattered most, she couldn't fall behind. She had never been beaten. She wouldn't be now. That night, in a Singapore hotel, a noise startled Elizabeth. Her heart boomed in her chest. A tiger was in her room. She was certain of it. Boldly, Elizabeth lit a candle. It wasn't a tiger, but a an enormous rat rifling through her stockings and sniffing her gloves. A rat was almost as awful as a tiger, but at least she wouldn't be dinner. Nellie set sail on the Oceanic, the very same steamer that had arrived with Elizabeth just 13 days before. The chief engineer, so confident in his ship, ordered his men to write on the engines, 
for Nellie Bly will win or die. Elizabeth explored the deserts of Aden, astonished at their ancient beauty. Her steamer continued across the Arabian. It skimmed the red and Mediterranean seas. And then a train carried her over the snow-covered mountains of Italy and on to France. By the time she arrived, the boat she needed to take had already left. In San Francisco, Nellie learned that blizzards had stopped the Central Pacific Railroad. No trains would get through for days. It was the worst snow the railroad had ever seen. Elizabeth hurried to England. Still, she missed two other ships. She had one more chance to cross the Atlantic, a final steamer, one train ride away. Nellie wouldn't let the snow stop her. She and McGinty took a train on the Southern Pacific Line instead. The deserts in Arizona and New Mexico flickered past. On Nellie went through Kansas to Chicago, well-wishers gathering at every station. From Indiana to Pennsylvania, crowds swelled with people waving handkerchiefs and hats. Elizabeth's ship, the Bothnia, was one of the slowest in the fleet. The Atlantic Ocean churned with storms, the worst winter in years. Elizabeth was so miserable she hardly moved from her berth. In Jersey City, a crowd swarmed, thousands strong. Train wheels groaned and slowed to a stop. As Nellie stepped onto the platform, three official timekeepers checked their watches. On January 25th, 1890, at 3.51 p.m. and 44 seconds, the great race ended. A 10 cannon salute boomed from Manhattan's Battery Park. Boats up and down the Hudson River whistled in celebration. 72 days, six hours, 11 minutes and 14 seconds. Nellie had beaten her own goal by almost three days. She traveled faster than she'd hoped for. Even bested Elizabeth Bisland. On January 30th, Elizabeth stood on deck as New York formed on the horizon. The Statue of Liberty held her torch high, beckoning the sea-weary travelers. Skyscrapers jutted their jagged man-made peaks a world away from Mount Fuji. Home. It was though she'd never left. At 1.30 p.m., the Bothnia pulled into a pier in New York Harbor. No official timekeepers waited. Only a modest crowd had gathered. The race had ended four and a half days earlier. Elizabeth didn't hide her disappointment. For 76 days, she'd given everything just to come in second. Nellie had won. She was famous. She'd shown everyone she was as daring and capable as any man. Elizabeth lost, but her journey had only just begun. She would write and travel for the rest of her days. In this newly whirling world made swifter by fast trains and steamships, Nellie and Elizabeth's race was an extraordinary feat. Both circled the globe more quickly than any who'd tried before. Both journeyed alone. Both took on the world and triumphed, each on her own terms. Check out this book if you want to learn more about Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland or other books like it. Here's an author's note. The more I read about Nellie and Elizabeth, the more it seemed to me that both women won the race, each in her own way. Nellie earned the recognition she longed for, becoming for a time the most famous journalist in the world. Elizabeth gained the opportunity to see the places she'd read about in books. Just months after the race, Elizabeth returned to England. There she befriended artists and authors, continued with her writing, and met her husband, who traveled with her when she returned to countries she'd visited years before. Most of the trip they spent in Japan, a country Elizabeth had come to love more than anywhere else in the world.